brazen attack on Istanbul's main airport kills dozens of people and heightens fears. It's the fourth major attack in the city this year. What can be done to stop the wave of terror? Also on today's program, Croatia marks 25 years of independence. But with no parliament and a struggling economy, is it still seen as the success story of the Balkans? And in picture this, a landmark ruling from America's top court. Judges strike down an abortion law in Texas, which threatened to close down clinics. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. They arrived like any other passenger to Atatürk Airport in a taxi. But the three men who entered Istanbul's main international terminal didn't come with tickets in their hands and bags on their backs. They came armed with guns and suicide vests and a determination to kill en masse and strike fear. Dozens of people were killed on Tuesday night's attack and hundreds more were injured. Well, the latest attack has dominated global headlines. So how does this historic city and this country carry on from here? Our newsmaker today is Turkey's security challenge as we ask what can be done to prevent more attacks. I, I heard police shooting. I saw the police shooting at someone mm -hmm. and everyone started screaming. He had hidden the gun over here and he's taken out and he's shooting up two times and he's beginning to shoot the people like that. A man put something in the x-ray machine and when it exploded, everybody around died. Terror has once again torn through one of the world's busiest airports. At Istanbul's international terminal, dozens of people were killed and hundreds more were injured in what's being described as a coordinated assault. According to reports, three attackers arrived in a taxi. Two suspects went upstairs to departures, one remained at arrivals where the first bomb was detonated. Another attacker detonated his bomb upstairs, while the third attacker went back to arrivals, waited for people to come out and detonated the final bomb. Officials say the evidence so far points to Daesh. The findings with security forces indicate that this terror attack was done by Daesh. Investigations into the attack continue. Daesh has never claimed responsibility for any attack in Turkey, but the government has blamed the group for attacks before. Turkey has been hit by a spate of terror attacks in the last year, and they're on the rise. Car bombs, explosive vests, and guns have been used to kill civilians, police, and tourists in multiple attacks carried out by different groups. Turkey has been fighting Daesh in Syria and Iraq, as well as the PKK inside its southern border. The security challenges for Turkey are becoming more complex than ever. Flights at Atatürk Airport have resumed, but the scars of the tragedy are everywhere. For the people of Turkey, these are open wounds. Grief has become all too familiar. The country's economy will no doubt suffer too, with tourism already falling to lows not seen in decades. World leaders reaching out after the attack have pledged support in the global battle against terrorism one that's pulled Turkey to the front line. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now in the studio to discuss the latest attack is Ahmed Yukleyen. He's the author of Localizing Islam and a professor at the Istanbul Commerce University. And in Tripoli, Lebanon, is Jana Jabur. She's a research associate at Seri Sciences Po. Both of you, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Let me start with you, Jana. Uh, it feels like deja vu every time there's, there's one of these attacks. Even though there has been no claim of responsibility, do you think that the signs point to Daesh? 
Yes, of course. I think there is uh, two elements that actually point to the responsibility of Daesh. The first one is the technique that uh, was used in the attacks yesterday. Uh, generally, uh, Daesh uses suicide bombings, whereas other groups would use uh, other techniques, such as, for example, uh, car bombings. This is one. Second, uh, one of the main objectives and one of the main goals of Daesh has been to actually undermine the image of Turkey and to undermine uh, the Turkish Turkish uh, economy and Turkish development. And um, uh, attacking uh, the airport, uh, the international airport of Ataturk is very symbolic because uh, it is meant to send a very direct and clear message to all foreigners, uh, whether Europeans or Americans or Arabs, not to come to Turkey as uh, tourists and not to visit uh, this country. And of course, this is extremely important mm -hmm. given that, that uh, um, uh, the development of Turkey actually uh, relies very heavily heavily on the tourist sector. Okay, let's bring uh, Ahmed in. I want to ask you of the other possible suspect, uh, because there's been no claim of responsibility, mm -hmm. the PKK, PYD, the mm -hmm. urban wing, the, the TAK, given that in the past few months they have targeted civilians, they've uh, not been afraid to use suicide bombers as, as we've mm -hmm. seen in, in Bursa and in Ankara, mm -hmm. are they possibly also as strong a suspect as Daesh here? Well, uh, if you look at the official statements, uh, we haven't really come across any direct reference to the other possibilities. So that is one. Uh, and I sort of agree with Jana on the issue that, you know, the indicators, and there are certainly some witnesses who are calling, uh, who are saying that, you know, they have uh, called uh, God's name before they were, you know, uh, doing their acts. So there are some indications that there is, uh, it kind of looks more like uh, uh, on the lineup of uh, Daesh mm -hmm. rather than a, a leftist or an ethnic nationalist oriented terror mm -hmm. organization. Yeah, Ahmed, as uh, Jana said, one of the messages was don't come to Turkey. Hopefully they, they, they're trying um, to collapse the economy, to, to hurt tourism in the country. Mm -hmm. What could one of the other messages be? Could it possibly be uh, Turkey stay out of Syria? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, of course, you know, uh, again, here we see that Daesh is, uh, has, wants to actually achieve several things all at once. Uh, in the short run, indeed, you know, they are under pressure in Syria, uh, so they want to expand the conflict into Turkey. They, they want to send the same message, as you pointed out, that you don't come in here, you know, I can actually hurt you at your uh, uh, home base. Um, but I will actually point out to a longer term uh, planning, which is, I think, in the background of the Daesh uh, attackers. And that is, they actually want to uh, fight against a multiculturalism, against uh, globalization. Uh, and that is, um, they are actually long-term planning. Of course, this is not how they will express themselves. But if you look at the attack points in Brussels, in, in, in Paris, in Orlando, most lately, uh, what we see is that uh, mixing of people, mixing of cultures, mixing of ideas, diversity, that is actually deep down what's mm -hmm. threatening to them. And I think, you know, uh, the choice of airports, I think, adds to that, um, mm -hmm. you know, comment, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Jana, Ahmed mentioned that they're against multiple countries. They're against diversity, cosmopolitanism, and multiculturalism. We've seen France attacked, Belgium attacked, Pakistan, the United States, Turkey, and, and the list goes on. Can there really be an, an, a, a unified, well, Lebanon, where you are, uh, of course, can there be a, a unified response from international leaders? President Erdogan called for this. Can there really be that response, given that so many countries are so heavily divided on what is the genesis of the issue. Syria, you have multiple ca camps and multiple policies. Yes. In fact, uh, President Erdogan has been calling for the past few years for the international community to show solidarity with Turkey and with the other countries hit by terrorism and has been calling the international community to actually be unified uh, in this fight against international terrorism as exemplified and illustrated uh, by Daesh today. The problem uh, in this common fight against terrorism is not only that the countries participating in the coalition against Daesh are divided on their political 
political on their political stances. But also, also the main um, important point is that uh, in the West, in Europe, and in the United States, there is um, a perception which I would like to call a misperception, which is that uh, Turkey is a country that supports terrorism or that is allied to extremist Islamist groups. I think um, we've seen it very clearly that since the uh, hostage uh, taking in Mosul in January 2014, when uh, uh, Daesh uh, took hostage 14, 49 actually uh, uh, Turkish uh, diplomats, Turkey has been extremely serious and extremely determined in uh, conducting uh, this war and this fight uh, against Daesh. And this fight of Turkey is carrying is um, uh, taking place not only in Syria and in Iraq, but also more and more on uh, Turkish soil, and it is being illustrated by different arrests mm -hmm. against uh, jihadists and against uh, um, uh, extremist radicals, but also arrests against dormant cells of Daesh. So I think today that there is a momentum, looking at what's happening around the world, in Brussels, in Paris, uh, in Lebanon, in Turkey, there is a momentum for all the people to become unified, to uh, put aside their misperceptions, and to start carrying out a real serious uh, war against uh, Daesh. Okay, Ahmed, given that this was a very coordinated attack, these things possibly take a lot of planning. Do you see them in any way linked to Turkey normalizing relations with not only Israel, but, but Russia as well within the same week? Could they have theoretically gone, hey, I don't like this policy, and therefore we're going to enact this... Um, attack on, on, on the airport? Mm. In my view, it is uh, unlikely. And the reason is um, those developments, uh, though they are very positive, until the last day, not too many people actually have hoped for or knew about it. That is the recent developments uh, or agreements uh, with Israel and Russia. There are maybe very small indications. Uh, and on top of that, the, this very attack at the airport is very sophisticated. It requires a lot of planning, uh, a lot of coordination. Um, uh, in my view, it largely looks like something that just coincided. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, on the other hand, I don't think they will. Uh, they they are sorry that they have uh, this kind of coincidence has happened. You know, if you think right. of from the strategic point of view of the ISIS, let's say, decision makers in in, right. in Syria, um, unintended good news for them. Yes. Perhaps. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, Vladimir Putin, after the normalization of relations, just today announced that he's lifting the travel restrictions on Russians coming to Turkey. You mentioned Bayram. You mentioned the the summer holidays. Russians before the troubles between the two countries with the, with the jet being shot down. Before that, Russians used to come to Turkey in huge numbers. Do you think that the Russian tourists right. might be targets of Daesh in the summer in Turkey? Well, um, I don't think so. I think there would, wouldn't be the only target of, of uh, Daesh attacks. In fact, the specificity uh, or the feature of Daesh attacks is that they are indiscriminate. So this is basically indiscriminate violence against Russians, against Arabs, against Turkish populations, against everybody. And this is at the heart and at the essence of Daesh ideology. So killing everybody, uh, uh, making violence uh, uh, wide spread, etc. So uh, maybe Russians might be victims of these attacks, but I don't think they would be uh, targeted specifically. Um, Ahmed talking about targeting civilians. So we saw in Brussels something that was unique and different was that instead of trying to get through all the various levels of airport security and attacking civilians, that those Daesh attackers um, opened fire and blew themselves up at the check-in counter. At Atatürk Airport, there's a security checkpoint even before the check-in counter, mm -hmm. and they conducted their attack there where people congregated. Does that suggest to us that, hey, no matter where you put that line, even if you put it two streets away from the airport or any other uh, major attraction, they're going to hit you there because they don't care? I, I agree, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I'm what actually, do we do? Yes, well, that is exactly what I want to talk about. That is, rather than these short-term strategy, intelligence sharing, all that, which all needs to be done, we really have to make a long-term, coordinated, 
uh, campaign, if you will, at all levels, at the individual level, civil society level, state level, and definitely at the global level. Now, um, um, the analogy I use, and then here I, I totally agree with Jana's comments on you know, how it, it gets you know, everyone involved. It, it's, most of our questions is often, how does Turkey get heard about this? And, or or uh, if it happened in the U.S., uh, how, 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 does does the, how does the U.S. get affected by that? Yeah. The, the thing is, the issue is that uh, most of us are thinking in terms of our nation state boxes. Uh, but these attackers, Daesh attackers, ha are global and they, their acts are global. So it doesn't really matter, you know, how uh, an, a country's economy is going or whether they will be hurt this or that way. They actually want to destroy, uh, you know, whatever is on their way. And, and since they want to rule as much parts of the world as they can, and certainly Istanbul is on their uh, kind of close target list, and they're very open about these things. They don't consider the regime in Turkey even Islamic, you know, despite mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, uh, of course it's not an Islamic regime, but, but, the, uh, but uh, the political leaders do have a very firm Muslim belief. They're not uh, Muslim enough for them. Right, right, definitely not. And no one else is other than, uh, other right. than themselves. Right. Okay, Ahmed and Jana, unfortunately I've got a wrap. Thank you both. <laughs>Croatia had to go through much worse. It was 1980. Yugoslavia's president, Marshal Josip Broz Tito, had died. With an iron fist, he held the confederation of five semi-states together. But without him, ethnic divisions emerged. And by 1991, Slovenia seceded. Meanwhile, in Belgrade, Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic was advocating the armed creation of a so-called Greater Serbia, one that would take in parts of Bosnia and Croatia. This may look like any fancy restaurant in Zagreb, but in fact, 25 years ago, history was made right here. This is where three key Croatian leaders met to discuss the future of the country. But just as they left the restaurant, the Yugoslav army dropped a bomb right where they had been sitting. And after that assassination attempt, the three men decided independence was the only way forward. Croatia's first president, Franjo Tuđman, was there. So was Yugoslavia's prime minister, Ante Marković, and this man, Stipe Mesic. Mesic was Yugoslavia's president and, ironically, commander of the same army that tried to kill him. The declaration triggered a four-year war with Yugoslavia's Serb forces. Croatia has laid the past to rest. It's now a member of NATO, the United Nations, and in 2013 joined the European Union. But it has the problems of a new state. It was a privatization. 
i u toj privatizaciji koja je bila koruptivne prirode, izmijenila se zapravo socijalna stratifikacija društva. Društvo se zapravo neprimjetno podijelilo. Despite this, Croatians say at least they can fight for the country's own destiny, no longer with guns, but at the ballot box. Soraya Leni, the newsmakers, Zagreb. Well, joining me now from Zagreb to discuss a turbulent, initially, but largely successful 25 years of independence for Croatia is former Deputy Prime Minister Vesna Pusic. Thanks very much for joining us, ma'am. Are you hopeful that a new government can arrest some of these signs of economic and political decline? I'm sure that a new government, especially if the new government gets a clear majority, I think that would be important this time around. Uh, we will, in 10 months, go for elections twice. So in September, we will have the second uh, elections in 10 months. And if, uh, after the elections, we emerge with a government with a clear and stable majority, in spite of some of the difficulties that were created in the last six, seven months, uh, I'm absolutely confident that, that we could sustain and regain some of the uh, momentum that we managed mm -hmm. to cre create in the past three years. Um, the, 2017 is economically, especially in terms of, of uh, the foreign debt and loans that we have to service, is going to be quite difficult. But if we manage to maintain the growth and uh, especially growth of industry and exports, um, I'm confident that a stable government will be able to, to pull through. Okay, let's broaden this out a bit. As an EU member, Croatia has recently blocked the opening of one of the chapters uh, for the accession of Serbia to uh, the European Union. So from the outside, it looks as if Croatia doesn't want Serbia to be a part of the club. From the outside, doesn't it not make sense for Croatia to be enthusiastic about the likes of Serbia, about the likes of Bosnia-Herzegovina, joining the European Union so they can reform their institutions as, as you did and, that, and the region can, can uh, prevent itself from slipping into the dark days of the past. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Croatia is and should be enthusiastic and has been throughout enthusiastic, not only enthusiastic, Croatia has initiated about two years ago, the new approach of the European Union to Bosnia-Herzegovina, for instance, which broke the stalemate that Bosnia-Herzegovina was sitting in for about five years regarding the accession to the European Union. Also, it is, I think, in Croatia's self-interest and in the interest of the stability of the entire region, for all the countries of the region, especially for our region, a uh, relatively big country like Serbia, to go through the process of transformation, uh, join the European Union, and basically have a common denominator in uh, jointly stabilizing the region. Mm -hmm. So Croatia absolutely should support Serbia's accession to the European Union. You worked so hard to go into the European Union, yet the Brits have voted to go out. Does that bemuse you, and do you worry about perhaps contagion and other countries following uh, the British? It worries me. It worries me because it harms the European Union and it certainly harms uh, Great Britain. It seems that a lot of people didn't really completely understand what this was all about. And uh, parts of Great Britain have voted in favor of staying. So I don't think we have seen the end of this, of this whole process. Okay. Vesna Pusic, pleasure having the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us. In today's picture this, the U.S. Supreme Court has made a landmark decision on abortion rights. Let's take a look.
And that's all in today's program. Our newsmaker today was Turkey's security challenge after a brazen attack on Istanbul's main airport. Dozens were killed and hundreds more injured in Tuesday night shootings and bomb explosions. It's the fourth major terror attack on Istanbul this year. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. As always, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.